Hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm going to do part two of the economics of bribery and corruption lecture. And basically what I'll do is I'll discuss a couple of experimental lab laboratory experiment papers. So the first one's blowing the whistle, which is thinking about uh, various antitrust policies in the context of a Bertrand pricing game. And so this is sort of motivated, at least in part, by recent European Union policy changes uh, allowing for leniency for like amnesty to participants and cartels who then report the cartel to authorities. And so this is a brilliant paper that's looking to see, well, what happens if we change some of the different types of like reporting or cartel policies and try to shift the incentives towards firstly, uh, not being in a cartel in the first place. And then secondly, reporting it if there is. And what I want you to do is besides just kind of thinking about how the laboratory experiment is used to kind of develop and, uh, and test our understanding of, and prediction of what these policies should do, look also at the parallels between what, what happens in this game and these games uh, and what happened in the Basu in the first part in the first lecture in the Basu proposal, which was about legalizing bribe giving and, um, but not bribe taking. All right, so the market game we're thinking about here is a discrete Bertrand model. I've actually got a video uh, uh, linked up on my YouTube thinking about the discrete Bertrand. And so you kind of learn a little bit more about it, but I'll describe it here. We've got three firms, so it's a triopoly. Each firm simultaneously chooses a price from the set, right, integers from 91 to 100. And then the firm choosing the low price splits the market and divides between themselves the difference between, say, the let's suppose the price is 92. So 92 minus 90 is two, divided by, say, two firms that have tied. So each would get one. And then the third firm would be a high cost firm and wouldn't get anything, right? So that's kind of what's happening. All right, so the assumptions are, the relevant assumptions are, well, consumer demand's completely inelastic for prices up to the consumer's maximal willingness to pay, which is 100. Quantity demanded is normalized to a single unit, possibly divisible, and, well, divisible in the case, like, to allow for ties. The per unit production cost is 90, right? So that's why it was, like, that's why it's between their price and 90. So it's, like, price minus whatever would be the marginal cost. All right. So there's a unique Nash equilibria, actually, where each of the firms set a price of 91. If they do this, everyone's gonna get one minus 90 is one divided by three, split three ways is a third. And then what they're gonna do is they're gonna say, okay, well, let's try four different treatments. Let's have like, a, they'll, they'll have the standard treatment, leniency, bonus, and ideal. And I'll kind of explain what happens in each of these. So here's standard. And this is based on kind of like the prevailing thought about cartels, which is like, it's bad if the leaders of firms get together. If they even just meet, we're assuming that they're talking about price collusion and that's bad. And so then this is the, this is the situation where uh, any type of documented meeting is evidence of a cartel. Oh, and sorry, as I'm, as I'm going over, I'm realizing that I've labeled this as 2003. This is the working paper version. This, this is a published paper. It's a later, it's uh, like 2000, it's like 2006, 2007 or something like that. Um, but 2003 is the working paper version, which I cited here because then you can find the working paper. Uh, you don't have to be logged into university to be able to find the paper if you find the working paper version. Anyway, so I should update. I, at this point, I'm not going to be able to. So, all right. Modern antitrust legislation. Oh, so I should say so the idea of standard, if you're distracted myself, goes back to Adam Smith from the Wealth of Nations, which says, People of the same trade seldom meet together, even for merriment and diversion. But the conversation ends in conspiracy against the public or in some contrivance to raise prices. Right, so this is saying that documented meetings are evidence of a cartel. Merriment. That's great. Merriment. Okay, so the market game uh, standard is an attempt to capture the essence of the law prior to the introduction of leniency clauses, which is like if you're determined to be, have been in a cartel, that's bad. So in stage one, each firm chooses whether or not it wishes to join a cartel defined as non-binding communication between the involved parties, which is arranged for only if all the firms wish to have a cartel. In stage two, each player, each player who is themselves going to represent a firm, chooses a price from this set we introduced before. Then stage three happens if and only if there was a cartel wherein they're able to report or not report. 
Firms' payoffs depend on their price choices, just as in the Bertrand model. Now the payoffs need to be may be modified by fines. So if somebody reports, each firm pays a fine. Uh, each firm pays a fine uh, equal to I, should, I said each equal to 10% of its revenue based on EU legislation, right? So suppose we're in the Nash equilibrium. So the payoff would have, so everybody would have said 91, three firms at 91, 91 minus 90 is one, split three ways is one third each. And now everybody would get, well, a fine of 10% of one third. So they would keep 90% of one third, right? So that's how standard works. Then leniency. Leniency is like standard, except in terms of how the fines are determined after the cartel has been formed. So if one firm reports the cartel, that firm doesn't have to pay a fine, while the other two pay the 10% of the revenue, right? So suppose we were in the Nash equilibrium. Each firm set a price of 91, and they would therefore be, before the fine, be re receiving a payoff of one third. Then the firm who reports the cartel keeps their one third and the other two firms only get 90% of one third as their payoff. So what if two firms report? Well, then each pays 5% of its revenue while the third pays 10% of its revenue. If all three report, each pays a fine of 6.67% uh, of the revenue. So relative to standard, what the scheme is doing is offering a reduction in the fine. Then there's bonus, which is identical to leniency in terms of how the fines are determined, right? So we have like, here's how the fines are determined, right? Five, so no fine if you're the only reporter, 5% of the revenue if you're, if you and another report, and then 6.6% .6 of revenue if everybody reports. All right, so but bonus has uh, the additional rule where all whistleblowers get to share amongst themselves all the fines paid by the non-reporting cartelists, right? So a lone whistleblower would pay no fine and collect the fines paid by the other two as a bonus. With two whistleblowers, each of them pays a fine of 5% of the revenue and collects half the fine of the third as a bonus. When all three firms blow the whistle, each of them pays a fine of 6.6%, but then there's no bonuses because there's nobody, right? All the fines paid by the non-reporting cartelist, then there's no non-reporting cartelist. Okay, so then ideal. So as a yardstick for measuring the success of the antitrust policy, it's natural to consider what would happen if it's just not possible to have a cartel. So this just removes communication. It's just like identical to like just a pure Bertrand pricing game. So the experiment took place at the University of Bonn. Uh, and they had 12 groups of three participants for each of the four treatments, except in leniency where they had 16 groups of three participants. So 156 participants in the experiment. Now the theory predicts standards should induce cartel formation that sustains maximal prices at equilibrium. So standards should get should get uh, the highest prices. Uh, similar for leniency, but the theoretical support is a little bit weaker than for standard. And then theory suggests that it actually should take bonus to thwart the cartels and then induce competitive pricing. So you shouldn't be able to get Theory suggests you shouldn't be able to get competitive pricing like you would with ideal uh, apart from uh, with these other two treatments and only for bonus. What happens in the lab? Well, in the laboratory, leniency displays significantly lower prices than standard, which actually gives the highest market prices of all treatments. Well, that's what theory predicts. Okay, The lowest prices are found in ideal. That's also what we should expect. And there's no significant difference, actually, between ideal and leniency. Leniency also gave the lowest percentage of cartel formation, right? Leniency gave lower cartel formation than, uh, than for instance, you know, bonus and standard. Okay. Market prices and bonus are above those, in, uh, those of ideal and leniency and not statistically different from those in standard, right? The highest number of cartels found were in the bonus treatment. Let's go back. What was what was bonus? Bonus was where? It was just like leniency. Well, what was leniency? Leniency was if one firm reports to the cartel, that firm per, doesn't pay a fine. The other two pay 10%. If two firms report, each pays 5%. If all three firms report, each pays a fine of 6.6%. Okay. Then what did bonus do? Bonus allowed all whistleblowers to get a share of all the fines paid from the non-reporting cartelists. All right. 
So relative to theory, these findings are surprising. What about behavioral theory? Right? So relative to theory, because theory was saying, well, bonus should actually thwart the cartels and induce competitive pricing, but it didn't. It, gave, it, it created this bad incentive to create a lot of cartels. This is interesting to reflect on and to think about like what happened and what, what's, what's going on in the experiment. Uh, one thing that could definitely be happening is you could have firms looking at this as another path to profitability, right? I'm going to be in a cartel. I'm going to report the cartel and I'm going to get the benefits from having reported. So I'm going to get the benefits of cartel pricing. Plus, I'm not going to pay as big of a fine. Plus, I'm going to get everybody else's fine payments. And so you could think of like why that would create this incentive uh, to engage in cartel and then to report under bonus. Okay, so anyway, so it's kind of a cool paper. Uh, the next thing I want to do is talk about this other paper, uh, GS and uh, Van Z. So what was this paper? That was uh, this one. Um, that's this paper, Bribery, Greed versus Reciprocity. All right, so I, here's a clip from uh, Yada Yada Econs. as a Seinfeld bribery example where they were trying to bribe their way into a crowded restaurant and it didn't work. The, uh, the person at the restaurant wasn't going to be corrupted. Okay, so bribery doesn't always work. What's the mechanism through which bribery actually works? Uh, is it a reciprocal exchange? Is it a hidden price? Or is it a way to increase payoffs like greed? All right, so this paper is actually kind of really cool. It, and so you'll kind of see this when we go through the, the design of the experiment. There's going to be a real effort task, which is brilliant, the way that they did this. And then there's a third participant acting as a referee picking a winner who can be bribed. All right, so they show participants in the laboratory are easy to corrupt, and the mechanism is greed. It's not reciprocity. And they're able to, this is one of the reasons why this is a brilliant experiment, they're able to separate out the motivations by their different treatments. All right, so the motivation, well, corruption's bad, and it's significant, right? It affects a lot of economic activity around the world. Since it's illegal, uh, obtaining good empirical data is difficult. Uh, so World Bank estimates something like a trillion dollars is exchanged in bribes. That's a lot. Uh, and then from an ethical perspective, well, corruption and bribery are more acceptable in some parts of the world than others. In order to reduce bribery, we want to understand the underlying motivations. So experiments are going to be useful because it's difficult to observe otherwise, and that's going to be the idea here. Also, uh, the experiments are going to help to be able to identify and isolate key aspects of the relevant behavior. In particular, this is necessary to be able to separate out whether the activity we see is better explained by bribery and greed or better explained by like a gift exchange and reciprocity. All right, so in this paper, they're going to try to test whether workers actually bribe. When they do, whether the bribe distorts the referee's judgment and what was the motivation. All right, so here's the game. We have a bribery game. There's two workers and a referee. The workers are going to compete against each other. The referee is going to declare a winner. The, the winner is going to receive some price, P. The loser gets zero. The workers can send some bribe, which can be up to half whatever is the price, right? Whatever, or I said price, prize whatever is half of the prize. The refs keep the winner's bribe and then returns the loser's bribe. That's the setup. The ref maximizes their monetary payoff by selecting the worker with the highest bribe, right? So it's in the ref's interest to take the biggest bribe. Under the assumptions that the payoff to the, or under these assumptions, the payoff to the ref is going to be, payoff to the ref is going to be just the bribe, right? Whatever is the winner's bribe. That's this asterisk means. All right, so the payoff to each worker is going to be, well, their prize less the bribe, right? Or zero if they aren't the one who's selected. In the experiment, the prize is going to be $10. So the max bribe is therefore half of that, $5. So the question is, do workers actually bribe? And if they do, do they choose the profit maximizing strategy, right? So even if the worker believes paying the high bribe is beneficial, they might still not want to do it because of moral costs if they believe this is unethical. Also, is it the case that bribing is going to distort the referee's judgment? Right? The referee is asked to base the winner on performance in the task, but selfish payoff maximizer should just choose on the basis of the bribe. Right? And if it does affect the ref's behavior, why? Could be a gift exchange explanation. Could be reciprocity. Right? 
or it could be greed. Maybe the refs are choosing the higher bribe when doing so benefits them. All right, so they've got a couple of different treatments. Keep winner and then keep both, right? So keep winner is if they keep the winner's bribe and keep both is if they keep both bribes. In the keep both treatment, the monetary incentives are not affected by the selection of the winner uh, in keep both because you're keeping both bribes. And therefore the judgment, uh, judgment distortions are not monetarily profitable. So this, the idea would be in the keep both treatment, they should choose whoever was the true winner. If reciprocity matters, we might expect the ref to accept the higher bribe as in the keep winner treatment though, right? So if it's a reciprocity story, even in the keep both treatment, we should expect whoever did pay the higher bribe should receive, should be judged as the winner. So this is brilliant because this is a treatment in contrast to the keep winner that allows them to be able to determine and ultimately reject uh, the idea that uh, of reciprocity being the explanation for bribery. All right, so then in order to compare the norm of reciprocity to the norm of not distorting judgment, they conduct another task where the distortion of judgment is impossible because there's no task. This is the no task treatment. Now the workers only submit bribes. So this treatment's just like keep both only without the effort task, and the ref is gonna keep money from both workers. As a final treatment, reject is used to test if the ref's behavior is robust to giving them the option to reject both bribes, right? In the other treatments, the ref has to accept a bribe, but in a reject, they're able to reject both bribes, not accept any bribes. Comparing reject to keep winner allows them to test if allowing the referees to reject the bribes is going to affect their behavior. The experiment took place at UCSD, University of California, San Diego. And the task was writing a joke about economists or about psychologists. The workers were also asked to state their expected likelihood of having a better joke than their opponent which wasn't revealed, the refs rated the quality of the worker's joke on a scale of zero to 10, then the selected, uh, selected winner by placing a card in the envelope of the winner and a loser card in the envelope of the loser. All right, so after the experiment was completed, they organized additional sessions with participants who hadn't taken part to be able to evaluate the quality of the jokes, right? Because whichever is the funnier joke is gonna be subjective. And so what they're gonna to try to do is come up with this sort of uh, rating system to be able to determine which are the jokes that people are determining to be funny and then are the refs judging the same joke as being funny as had these other participants. All right, so a total of 400 individuals evaluated the quality of the joke on a scale of zero to 10 from several pairs to determine which was funnier. Raiders then viewed the same pairs as refs had during the experiment. Each raider judged a total of six pairs of jokes randomly drawn, and each pair was rated by between 18 and 21 independent raiders, right? So the, this is to be able to come up with something that's like admittedly subjective to make it a little bit more objective, right? So I look, there's there's a little this this is hard to do, but I think this is cool. And I really like this because I think this is a good way to provide sort of a nice robustness check. They've got this sort of independent board who's determining which are the funny jokes. And then they've got this sort of like actual effort task rather than something like super contrived. So this is cool. I, I really like this experiment. All right, so do workers bribe? Well, yeah, most of the workers, 85% sent a bribe in the keep winner treatment. The average bribe was $2.80. Workers in the keep both treatment mostly don't bribe, right? Zero uh, bribed in 66% of the cases and the average bribe was 90, uh, 90 cents. So this is a little interesting. Firstly, looks like you can think of the incentive for the workers. They're saying, well, why would I, why are we, we're both bribing and I'm not gonna, maybe I'm not expecting I'm gonna get anything for my bribe, so why would I give a bribe? So that's one thing, thinking about the incentives. The other thing is the average bribe being pretty small here, uh, that's, I think that's interesting relative, you know, relative to the average bribe in the, in the keep winner treatment. You know, so what they want to be able to do, and I, I like this paper, So, but what they want to be able to do is they want to talk about, you know, is this a reciprocity story or a gift exchange story? Well, you know, maybe if we're talking about such a small amount, it's really difficult to 
maybe it's really difficult to activate reciprocity preferences. Usually you think of gift exchange, you think of something kind of, well, a little bit larger than 90 cents. So anyway, a little bit larger than like 10%, right? Because like 10% of the prospective like $10 prize, 10% is like small relative to a dictator game. So anyway, so uh, looking at their results, there's, or here's the, luckily the fraction of the data, this is just showing the pricing, right? So across, so here's the bribe amount, uh, keep winner treatment is in red and then keep both treatment is in blue. Uh, results. Does bribery distort the ref's judgment? Well, a large majority of refs, 86% of the keep winner treatment, award the winner uh, award the winner payment to the worker offering the largest bribe, right? So does bribery distort the ref's judgment? Yeah, it seems like. By contrast, a better joke judged by the independent raiders wins 50%, 58% of the time, which was not significantly different from chance. Uh, when referees can maximize their payoffs by choosing the higher bribe, bribery distorts judgments. Refs choose the worker with a higher bribe, not the funnier joke. So interesting. All right. So I'm going to, I cut off all the, all the bottoms here, but you can see kind of the fraction this is the fraction of the winners. Um, keep winner treatment, uh, better bribe, better rating. So the keep winner treat it, treatment, um, the fraction of winners were typically those with the better bribe in the keep both treatment. Typically the winner was those with the better, with the better uh, joke. And so this suggests, indeed, it be a bribery, a greed story, rather than a reciprocity story. Uh, does bribery distort the ref's judgment? In the keep both treatment, only 64% of refs award the winner as the worker with the higher bribe, not st statistically larger than chance. Uh, by contrast, the better joke wins 72% of the time. So the results suggest when the ref's payoff does not depend on the choice of the winner, the bribery does not distort the ref's judgment. Ref's worker... Uh, ref chooses the worker who writes the funnier joke, right? All right. Now, comparing keep both and keep winner allows them to be able to determine whether we see greed or reciprocity as reflected in the data. Uh, turns off, turns out, bribery pays off, distorts the judgment in the keep winner treatment, as we saw, but not the keep both treatment, right? So why are higher bribes ineffective in the keep both treatment? Well, could be the case... Possibly the norm of not distorting judgment is stronger than the norm of reciprocity, right? Uh, hence, the ref ignores the bribe. Comparing keep both with no task, right? No task is where you're only bribing and not getting a task, not doing anything. Let's them investigate the relative strength of norms. In keep both, the ref chooses the higher bribe 63% of the time. In no task, the higher bribe wins 94% of the time. The average bribe larger in the no task treatment. So the need to distort judgment presents the refs with an additional moral cost of rewarding the higher bribe. Uh, so in terms of like our reflection, well, refs seem happy to reward the worker who sends more money than the uh, when the reward does not require them to distort their judgment, such as no task, because there's no judgment. But, but not when it does require distorted judgment. Uh, in this population of the subject pool, the moral cost of distorting judgment appears stronger than the norm of reciprocity. Now comparing the reject treatment, this is where they don't have to accept any bribe, to the keep winner treatment shows whether allowing refs to refuse bribe affects their behavior. Well, in the reject treatment, the higher bribe wins 100% of the time. <laughs> Compared to keep winner, we're at 186% of the time. Refs in the reject treatment chose the better joke approximately the same rate as in the keep winner treatment. Only two refs in the sample rejected both bribes. In both cases, the high bribe won anyway. Allowing the refs to reject the bribe didn't really affect their behavior. So this is looking between the reject treatment was yellow and then this red is the keep winner treatment. A uh, fraction of winners with the, in the reject, in the uh, reject treatment with, um, let's see, better bribe that won uh, was a little bit higher and then with a better rating. Yeah, so, okay. Conclusions. Well, a considerable number of workers are willing to send a bribe to influence the ref's decision. Uh, the refs systematically reward the higher bribe when they can and keep only when they can keep only the winner's bribe. When the ref keeps both bribe uh, bribes, then having a higher bribe wasn't nearly as effective, and the relative importance of the worker performance greatly increased. That was where we saw much lower bribes anyway. Uh, distorting the true ranking generates moral costs. 
which maybe we have evidence to believe it crowds out reciprocity if the if the norm against distorting judgment is bigger than the norm against uh, or norm for reciprocity conclusions moral costs are overcome when the distortion of judgment maximizes the ref's payoff right so the ref ignores the norm of not being swayed by the bribe when they're able to maximize their payoff by taking the bribe right so when it's in the ref's own best interest this suggests greed, greed is driving driving bribery rather than reciprocity. Right? Reciprocity is weaker than not distorting judgment, which is weaker than profit maximizing. Interesting, this is saying the profit maximizing incentive is the strongest incentive of these three sort of motivations. Okay. All right, very good. So that kind of concludes the, the discussion of the experiment. I think it's kind of cool. It's kind of a cool experiment, uh, kind of a cool setup to be able to de determine whether the motivation is greed or bribery or something else, right? And so I think that's kind of cool. Um, and also I really like the effort task because it's not this sort of made up task. Well, I mean, it's, it's an actual task. They actually are writing jokes that are actually funny or unfunny, right? All right, the last part is just kind of like discussion question. Like if we were doing this in regular classroom, I'd show some clips and then kind of think about reflecting. Um, and so one important thing is thinking about like the, the, the role of bribery as sort of like a cultural artifact. So when I think of like, how can we tell the difference between bribery as being part of culture, like something along the lines of gifting uh, versus like bribery as being like more severe. How should we treat different forms of bribery? How should we think about it? This is oh interesting, like thinking back in terms of like the ethics. So uh, in the Republic, Socrates has this belief that the reason why people are immoral is a lack of education. People haven't learned that whatever it is that, that hadn't learned better behavior, hadn't learned that bad behavior could be eradicated by uh, moral education. So my question is, do we believe bribery and corruption are things that education can be affected again, effective against, such as like moral education? Okay, so kind of pause, kind of reflect on these questions. Um, how can bribery and corruption be addressed once it becomes ingrained in a company's culture? That's that's a problem. Like, what if you're part of a company now where everybody's doing something immoral? It looks like you got to get a different job, I think, right? Um, and, and hopefully there's hopefully there's good whistleblower laws in your country, I guess, or in your you know where your your juris jurisdiction. How are we able to get an equilibrium where so many people are working for the good of the company above all else, and kind of turning their back on turning their back on corruption. All right, so then think carefully, what duties, if any, do develop do governments in developed countries have to reducing corruption in the developing world? You can think in particular, if there's governments that are trade, or you know, if there's trade or there's interactions and whatever, um, should, you know, should we pay bribes? Should we not pay bribes? You know, so on and so forth. Um, so in light of our study of behavioral economic theory, what sort of policies might be effective in reducing the prevalence of corruption? We had a couple different suggestions. All right, so these are interesting questions now, just kind of reflect on, kind of process having gone through the lectures. Uh, these are also not too far from the types of questions that I'd kind of develop and then uh, sort of enhance to be uh, exam type questions. But um, anyway, so at the end of the video here, hope you enjoy the video. Go ahead and conclude and I'll I'll see you next time.